Okay, I'm Katie Culver, and we're back with another Media Law Chat. I'm here today with Derek and Silver. Derek, why don't you introduce, us, introduce yourself, uh, tell us where you're from, and tell us what case we're going to cover today. Well, first and foremost, I want to thank you for, for doing these, and I want to thank you for inviting me to be on. My name is Derek and Silver. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Media, Film, and Journalism Studies at the University of Denver. Uh, I teach primarily classes on media law and internet law. Uh, today we're talking about one of the seminal First Amendment cases that you've probably all uh, heard about, and that's New York Times versus Sullivan. Okay, so I asked everybody to pick a top case. Tell me why you picked this top case. Um, so I've been writing about defamation my entire career. Um, it was one of the first papers I published was on defamation, and I'm working on a paper right now on defamation. And to me, um, New York Times versus Sullivan is such a seminal case for so many reasons. But it's really very interesting because of the history behind it. Um, Sullivan is as much a civil rights case as it is a defamation case. And one of the things I try to point out to my students is that uh, almost as soon as Sullivan announced the actual malice standard, um, it was a unanimous opinion and all the justices signed on to it. And then almost immediately, all the justices decided it was a terrible standard. And they sort of started picking it apart. And for the next 20 years, started couldn't figure out how to apply actual malice and couldn't figure out who it applied to or what it applied to. And by the end, people like Justice Byron White, who was part of the majority in Sullivan, were like, I want to get rid of this. Like, this just doesn't make sense to me anymore. And I explained that to students by saying, um, you know, Sullivan in its original format was, was, was a seditious libel, libel and a... Um, a civil rights case and all the justices came together as much to support the civil rights movement and as much to advance the civil rights movement as they did to establish a First Amendment standard for defamation. What they really realized is without First Amendment protection, northern newspapers would, would, would have been sued out of existence by southern government officials and the civil rights movement wouldn't have been covered and it would have effectively ended because these were the media outlets that were bringing this information and bringing these tragedies to Northern populations who otherwise would not have known about it. Yeah, I think that is my, what I find to be the most fascinating element of the case as well. And I think it's often the most misunderstood. I think that, um, you know, other than, you know, we geeks <laughs> who pay attention to it, I think that's been lost to history for a lot of people. And it, I think it's something that today, when you look at, um, you know, what some people frame as a tension between free expression and social justice, that point is really lost. Like, we're, we're, we don't raise it enough. It's something that I'd like to hear all of us talk more about. Um, so it's interesting that you say uh, even uh, some, of, some of the justices who were part of the decision came to, uh, came to um, say later, <laughs> where do we go with this? It's, it's under some pressure now, right? Um, Clarence Thomas saying he thinks um, Sullivan needs another look. Certainly President Trump uh, putting a lot of pressure on the idea of um, how difficult it is to bring a defamation claim. How, how strong do you think Sullivan is today? I have no worries about Sullivan. You know, um, President Trump saying that he wants to loosen up libel laws is just more um, hyperbole from somebody who loves to be bombastic. Um, Clarence Thomas is very interesting. Clarence Thomas, especially in First Amendment cases, really loves to write these kind of way out in, right, we'll call it right field, way out in right field opinions, where he puts forward, um, you know, these, these, these really strange ideas of just getting rid of precedent that's been around for years. So first it was the Central Hudson test in advertising law. He was like, let's get rid of that. And then it was, uh, you know, I think we really need to look at this actual malice standard. Uh, let's look at that. And then just today he announced, well, I think we need to get rid of this overbreadth standard. I don't really like uh, the overbreadth standard. Let's just bail on that. And that just came out today. And all of these are, um, you know, sometimes dissenting opinions, sometimes concurring opinions, and nobody else joins them. So I'm not really worried uh, today about, um, you know, suddenly four of the other justices being like, hey, I think Thomas has this right. Let's, let's get rid of the actual malice standard. Um, I do think that there are some interesting develops. I do think when Thomas writes, he is writing not for his fellow justices or even for lower courts. I think frequently when Thomas writes, he is writing for law school students. So he's trying to plant these ideas in future judges' heads uh, about the way that the law should be. Um, I do think that there are lots of questions about who actual malice should apply to and whether the um, standard has been pressed too far. 
um, especially with the internet. Um, you're starting to see judges, I think, sort of question whether, re so remember all these cases, all these precedents, the, you know, were basically from 1964 until 1986. The media landscape looked amazingly different and media ethics were amazingly different. And so Sullivan is really premised on this idea of breathing room and that the New York Times might make honest mistakes, right? That's what actual malice is about. It's about protecting honest mistakes as opposed to protecting lies. And we love this statement in, in Sullivan about uninhibited, robust, and wide open debate. And that's what gets quoted a lot. But my favorite quote from the case is actually, the press needs the, the breathing room to survive and erroneous statements are inevitable in debate. And I always ask my students, like, what does that mean to you? <laughs> and what it means is honest, ethical newspapers who are trying to get it right make honest mistakes. And that's what the Sullivan Standard is about. It's protecting honest mistakes. Um, I think there is real concern among slower court judges about how it's being applied to people who are not making honest mistakes. They are they are engaging behavior that, that even if it's not actual malice, it certainly rises to the level of reckless disregard for the truth. Um, and so I think we'll, we'll see some pressure on lower courts, particularly as it comes to internet speech and particularly as it comes to private speakers. Um, there's a lot of courts that have said, hey, we don't want this standard to apply to private speakers and we don't want it to apply to private speech. So expand on that a little bit, because that's something that um, is very much an open question here in uh, my state, Wisconsin, um, that, you know, what standard applies for a private plaintiff in a private matter, so no matter of public concern, and we're sort of like, we don't know yet. <laughs> I tell it to my students all the time. I, I say, okay, I'm going to teach you what the general rules are, and then I want you to put your pens down because I'm not going to test you on this because there's no good answers to this. So don't, That's don't exactly write this down. what I say. This will not be on the exam because I don't know the correct answer. <laughs> We're on the exact same page. I was like, the correct answer to this is what jurisdiction are you in? That's, that's the correct answer. So we have all these courts. So, so remember before Sullivan, um, the, the, the standard in defamation cases was no fault at all, right? It was mm -hmm. all you had to do is prove it was published, prove it was about you, and prove it was defamatory, and that's it. Um, some courts have moved back to that standard, have said, well, um, after reading the, this, this litany of cases that come from Sullivan to Dun & Bradstreet, we think, the, we think the First Amendment doesn't apply to private speech uh, on matters of private concern. Um, that just that we can do whatever we want to. We're going back to the common law. Uh, other jurisdictions have said, no, well, we think that some standard must apply. It has to at least be negligence, we think. But there really is, is no guidance. You know, this is the, the Supreme Court hasn't taken a defamation case in years. Um, you know, it could, and then Thomas could have his fun and write, you know, a, <laughs> a, an opinion about getting rid of Sullivan. But I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of questions the court could really clear up because it has just completely muddled the waters since Sullivan. You know, it needs to address what happens when a private individual defames another person on a matter of private concern. It needs to uh, figure out whether Sullivan applies to non-media defendants because there are some jurisdictions have said, well, if you read the dicta in those cases, it's all about the media. Mm -hmm. So if you're not the media, it doesn't apply. So that's kind of a, a really weird outlier there. Um, there's been some wonderful research on criminal libel. You know, in all of our textbooks, we write, oh, criminal libel is gone. But there was some really great research uh, that came out of your state that said, well, I don't know if criminal libel is gone. You know, there's a lot of these sort of weird things. Um, and so the court should really kind of step up and really kind of clean up uh, the kind of scattered debris that is defamation right now. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it is such an interesting landscape. I think um, one of the things that my students struggle with, particularly in the internet um, context, is protection um, for people who, in their minds, don't deserve it. So I, if I had to, if I, I think if I surveyed my classes, they would say, this ought to apply only to media defendants. <laughs> they really would not have uh, a lot of, um, they would not be protecting um, non-media defendants. And yet, if we are talking about a robust, wide open debate, how 
do you argue that we shouldn't all enjoy that protection? Why should there be some sort of special grant um, to news media? And then also, even if there were some special grant, how do you define who is news media? What, you know, if we all are on Twitter, is there an element in which we're all journalists now? Well, absolutely. And if you, if you go back and you read, um, I'm teaching internet law right now. And so my, my students and I just read uh, ACLU versus Reno. And there's that really just powerful stirring language from Stevens about how um, on the internet now it's all, it's the world's most amazing soapbox. You can find any information you want. We are all town criers. We can all get that information out. And, and platforms like Twitter where, you know, you can reach an audience of who knows how many people. Um, if you remove the protection for private speech, all that power immediately goes away. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you have to sort of think about is, is every new media has democratized the ability to communicate, right? So at first it was monks sitting in their uh, cathedrals writing by hand. Then we had the printing press and everyone said, oh no, this, everything's gonna be awful. Now everyone can read. And then we had uh, the radio and then we had television and then we had the internet and all these things have always democratized access to communication. It's gone from very small people, the monks, to the media, to now really everybody. And that, that, that throws a huge monkey wrench into so many aspects of defamation because defamation being largely common law, you know, has been around for, for hundreds of years. And now we're trying to sort of figure out like, how does this apply? What does this mean? What do we do? But I think we have to be really careful when we talk about, um, taking First Amendment protection away from speakers we don't like. Um, and I used to tell my students, imagine somebody you completely disagree with on every level is suddenly in power. And now I can take out the imagine part. I can just yeah. say, <laughs> and, and whenever my students are like, well, well, we should all, we should decide like what speech is good and what speech is bad. I said, okay, do you want our current administration deciding who's a good speaker and who's a bad speaker? Do you want our current administration deciding who is the media and who is, can you imagine who Donald Trump thinks is the media and who he thinks is not the media? You know, that's, I get really worried about that. Mm -hmm. I think another concept that's really muddy right now is what is a matter of public concern? Uh, you know, it, well, I mean, Snyder v. Phelps <laughs> is a really good example of something where a lot of people disagree on what is and is not a matter of public concern. But for the reasons that you just um, just uh, alluded to, I would be pretty liberal in how I apply that term. I would I would be broad, even though I may disagree so vehemently. Um, we I think to be protective, uh, we need to be we need to be wide in what we how we classify those matters. I I agree. And my favorite line from well, there's a lot of great lines in Snyder. It's a very interesting case, but one of my favorite parts of it is when Justice Roberts says, we realize we haven't really done a very good job of explaining what a matter of public concern is. <laughs> it's like, you think? <laughs> Thanks for admitting that at least. I'm glad, I'm glad we, we both agree on that. So whenever I bring that up to my students, you know, I always say, um, take this with a grain of salt. And, it, and it's sort of like, you know, you, you talk about private, private speech and saying, I don't know what's gonna happen. So I always say, I used to tell my students that judges are, unwilling to in, interpret this narrowly, that they, that they generally rely on the media. But then what really, what, what I now have to sort of um, come to terms with is the Hulk Hogan case um, mm -hmm. involving, it wasn't a defamation case, but it was a, it was a privacy case. And it was, it was a publication of embarrassing private facts. And as you know, and as your students know, um, one of the defenses to that is if the material is newsworthy. And the jury ruled that the, the judge refused to rule that a sex Hulk Hogan sex tape was a matter of public concern. What they said was, okay, in for the, the knowledge that there is a sex tape out there is a matter of public concern, but the sex tape itself is not a matter of public concern. And so I always tell my students, like, I don't really know the answer here. Like it, it I think the internet is changing things. And like your students see, like, you know, there's, there's this pushback about, well, not everything, just because you're interested in it, just because the public is interested in it, doesn't mean it's a matter of public concern. Yeah, that Hulk Hogan Gaw Gawker case was just so it's just fascinating on so many different levels. 
um, it, you know, not least of which it being funded by someone who wanted to take Gawker out and did. Um, I, I'll admit when that decision came down, I was afraid. I was afraid of, you know, what this was going to mean. Um, and I, and it, the fact that it hasn't played out in the super scary way that I envisioned, I think, is largely because it wasn't a defamation case. It was a very particular set of facts that isn't, or is never, I was gonna say isn't often replicated, but maybe is never <laughs> replicated. Had it been a defamation case, I think we could be in a much, a much darker place right now, where you, know, yeah, you, I, you can like pick off media targets one by one if you have the funding to do it. I agree, well, I mean, that going back to Sullivan, I mean, that's really what Sullivan was, right? Is that L.B. Sullivan found this ad in the New York Times and he targeted the New York Times. He went after them to punish them for the coverage um, that, they were, that they had of the South. You see the same thing in Gawker. You see a very wealthy individual who was outed by Gawker Magazine or Gawker Online or whatever you want to call it and was very upset and decided he was going to get his revenge. And he didn't get his revenge via a defamation case, he got his revenge via an invasion of privacy case. And that, you know, that's the biggest thing that I worry about is that for years, so let's go back to Sullivan. If you, Sullivan was a civil rights case, but you also have to remember that at the time, um, public respect in the press was at an all time high, right? The mainstream media had just, um, you know, the civil rights movement, um, we had, we were coming up to the Vietnam War, we were coming up to Watergate Gate, the press at the time was largely seen as this force of good in our society. Um, since then, if you look at public opinion polls, people who trust the press, um, it's gone down, you know, and we are not considered the, uh, the bulwarks of society, the, the watchdogs of society that we once were. And that's what I get worried about. I worry, I worry about this rhetoric, not changing judges. Like I, I don't think, some judge on a, on a federal district court in Wisconsin is going to say, you're right, President Trump, we should loosen up libel laws. Um, but what I do wonder is, will juries, will we start seeing like really big rewards from juries? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure in your law and ethics class, you know, you talk about the, the Food Lion case. And if, you know, if you listen to the jury in the Food Lion case, they are clear. They were like, we wanted to punish Diane Sawyer. Mm -hmm. She came in here and she was so hoity-toity and she was so full of herself. We were, we were taking her down. And, and that's what I, I, I worry about. And I think you, I also guess, I guess, I don't know, um, but I, I'm thinking the pink slime, um, the, the meat case, the settlement in that case reflected a fear of what that jury decision might look like. That's why you had this, the settlement, like we're not, we're not taking it to that group of people. Yep, and I think the, the thing that students also have to realize is, is that is frequently a calculation that is made by an insurance company. That, that's not just CBS News' calculation. Uh, CBS News, you know, their contract with their insurance companies, their insurance company gets, gets to come in and look at the, the, the exposure. Mm -hmm. And so that could be as much as the insurance company being like, hey, well, well, and I can't remember off the top of my head, was that 100, 170 million? It was, uh, it's over 100. Well, yeah. More money than I have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but was it CBS? I think it was ABC. Oh, it was ABC. That's right. It was, it was ABC. ABC. It was ABC. So, um, yeah. I just, I just find it interesting that these two huge cases, both ABC, both involving food, our, our food distribution. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that, that definitely weighed heavily on their mind. You know, or you look at the, the grandstanding lawsuits, you know, the, the billion dollar lawsuits filed over the John Bonet Ramsey case and, and mm -hmm. you know, and people or you know, the, the Washington Post case, you know, involving the, the protester. Um, you know, you see people just swinging for the fence and saying, well, you know, let's do the calculation here. Is it worth your time to settle? Mm -hmm. And then also when you, ha when you are in a, an industry with a not even more than disrupted, <laughs> a crumbling business model, will you have the resources to defend yourself? And that's something that I, I think we don't see, um, we don't have a good handle on what is the effect of threatened suits when it comes to local journalism, um, you know, that this is not a time where people can, can defend themselves. And so, so how self-sensorial do we get in response to those kinds of threats? 
Well, this was just absolutely, yeah, absolutely. fabulous. What a great conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me and, uh, and we can talk about other cases down the road. Well, I just want to thank you again. This was, this made my day. This was really fun and, uh, and looking forward to watching the video once you finish editing it. All right. Sounds great. Have a great day, Darren. Take care. Bye-bye.